So I am going to take the help of these four books to show you how I annotate. Uh, based on my requirements, I annotate in different ways, obviously. So let's start with the one which I annotated the most. So for that, I am going to... Well, I didn't really annotate this one much. But anyway, let us start with A Thousand Splendid Sons by Khalid Husseini. Now, I um, required this book for my course. That's why I did as much annotating in th this book as I did. Because otherwise, I don't annotate much. For instance, when it comes to supposing fantasy books I read and all, I don't really annotate much. But sometimes... Um, in books like these which I read for my course I annotate the important lines and certain things that I have to remember and all of that certain lines which I find are very beautiful certain facts I need to remember and all of that for instance um, this is a question mark and like questions I pose myself as well certain lines that I love for instance, the first chapter, I think this is the first chapter, no, third chapter, the third chapter of A Thousand Splendid Sons contain a truckload of wonderful lines, beautiful, beautiful lines. And this is one quote from this book, which is so common, everybody loves it. And it's just like a compass needle that points north, a man's accusing finger always finds a woman, always. You remember that, Mariam. So it's like... Even today, it's kind of relevant, although the, the degree of the relevancy differs in different countries, yes. But let me show you how I annotated this book. As you can see, I did not really mark much inside the book, but I dog marked the pages which I thought were important and I would refer to. So for this book, I mostly wrote the notes in my note, note copy. So as you can see, this is the way in which I annotated. I have got this book. I, I have written the notes chapter by chapter. So this is chapter one. I've written like Nana, Mariam, the characters basically. The facts that were given, all of that. Um, again, for themes as well because we need to uh, analyze the themes as well. This is one which I um, found in the beginning, superstition as well as mental health is issue. Uh, all of that, as you can see, the whole theme of endurance is really, really important in this book, really recurring. Then we have child psychology, um, all of that. This is basically how I annotated um, the whole of the book, as you can see. It's, it's kind of simple. Um, it helps me remember the facts. And later on when I'm making notes and all, although I don't think I'll be making notes for this one, it really helps me remember because, see, for instance, the day before the exam, you obviously cannot go through this whole book. I mean, it's thick. It's really thick. So you cannot read this whole book before the day of the exam. So what I do is that I go through all of these notes that I made for each chapter. Yeah, till here, chapter 51. So I go through all of these notes and it really helps me to remember all the facts uh, that I may have forgotten, all the themes which are important and all of that because this note is a very, very comprehensive note that I have made. Um, there are different shades to it because firstly, all of these I made when I was reading the book. So that's that. Second was when we have, we have basically discussions, class presentations. Each student um, say, gives a presentation of either two chapters or three chapters and like that we complete the whole book in class so sometimes i may have skipped out on certain observations so when the person is giving the presentation i of course i'm hearing her or him and they make certain observations which i haven't made so i add them here so as that is the second layer and the third layer is what the teacher discusses what the teacher says and all of that and sometimes when I am kind of confused. Of course, I go to the internet. The internet has been very helpful. Cannot deny that. But yeah, that is why I think this note is very comprehensive for me, especially because there are so many layers of thinking and introspection that goes within it. My own, my friends, my professors, and sometimes from the net as well. So it's really, really helpful.
So it's really, really helpful for me when I can um, like think of making notes, I guess. But like before the exam, it's really, really, really helpful. And then there are certain things that I like to um, focus on. For instance, we have here the kindness of strangers when Abdul Sharif um, comes to tell Leila about what has happened to Tariq and all of that. If you have read the book, you will know about the irony in this and all of that. And then um, the importance of the title, which is taken from Saibi Tabrizia's poem, uh, One Could Not Count the Moon Set Shimmer on Her Roofs or the Thousand Splendid Suns That Hide Behind Her Walls. So what I thought of the meaning of the title, what a thousand splendid suns mean, which I thought was illusion to time, people, the endlessness of life, the cycles of life in a way, the ambiguity in it as well. So all of that, um, it is very, very comprehensive. I sound like a salesperson trying to sell you my notes, <laughs> but yeah, the person is political. The um, mixture of the union of the person and the political when that happens is basically um, at this point like the death of Ahmad and Noor and all of that uh, for instance Harami as a social construct there are my thoughts all in these pages and yeah the three hearts mean I really love this chapter so that's that that's a very personal thing <laughs> Because like if you all have read the book, it's a very, very beautiful book. And I really recommend you all to pick that up because it's just, it's so, so poignant. There are so many levels of um, meaning. There is romance, there is familial love, there is sisterly love, sisterhood, um, marriage as a binding um, institution and not even in a good way. Um, all of that, the dominance of men, the oppress oppress oppression of women. Wow, I cannot speak today. And like there are so many levels, but apart from that, I think the writing, which is sort of matter of fact, but then again, kind of introspective and and just so bittersweet. I really love the writing. And that is why, um, I guess, I really recommend the book to you all. I also have yet to read um, uh, And the Mountains I Code and um, The Kite Runner, as well as, uh, Cypria, which I'll get to soon, as soon as I get the time. Now, again, different, different um, themes. For instance, we have foreshadowing, we have the relationship between Aziza and uh, Zalmai, and then the reference of Titanic, the movie, uh, with Jack and Rose, and all of that. And that's why I really, really like it. Um, this is a, this is the emoji of a crying thing because it, this chapter made me cry. Um, and then chapter 45 is less um, dialogue, more action. So when I see this, um, this four words, in fact, I remember what happened in, all, in this chapter. And so my memory is reinforced and the whole idea of the book is again reinforced in my mind and it it really is important again uh, as you can see uh, these lines in double inverted commas are actual direct quotes from the book again um, I wrote volumes if you know what I mean you know what I mean so that's from page 329 it's like a reference go to see go see page 329 to um, get an idea of the conversation and all of that and then we have um, the microcosm um, in the household in Rashid's household Rashid's household is basically a microcosm of all the different households the women of the different households the their treatment at the hands of the husband again this is a generalization because um, when you are reading a book you sort of have to look at it like that as a microcosm I'm sure not all husbands and wives, husbands and wives were like that. I mean, Fariba wasn't with her husband. Lela's parents were very good, very open-minded and everything. So again, generalization, seeing it as a microcosm of the general society because men beating their wives was normal. It's sad, but that had become normal and men treating their wives equally. 
yeah, men treating their wives equally was seen as a deviance. For instance, the relationship between Fariba and her husband, Hakim, I think his name was. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I end on chapter 51. Again, uh, you have to bring back certain things that happened earlier. For instance, what Hasina had once told Leila that they'll have many kids, but then Leila would make them proud and all of that. And again, the naming of the kid and all of that. It's very, very um, poignant. Again, we have a theme of chaos, anarchy, when the Twin Towers go down, um, all of that. Uh, so that's it for uh, my annotating of A Thousand Splendid Sons. Now let's move on to Beloved and I'll tell you how it went for me. As you can see, um, I do not have much of a note for Beloved, but that's because um, this book is, um, I do not know how to describe it, but it's a very, very good book, of course. I have the basic storyline sort of here, and um, okay, the thing is, I really enjoyed the book. There are four parts, if I'm not wrong. There are four parts, four or three parts. Well, mm, there are three parts, all right. But why do I feel like there were four? Maybe I'm mixing it up with another book. That has to be it. Yeah. 124 was quiet. Yeah. So there are three parts in this book. And the thing is, the beginning and the end was very interesting. But the middle, however, sort of dragged. I took quite a few days, quite a few days to read this book because it was just at one point, I like didn't really want to continue much because it was very introspective, introspective and delved a lot into the human psyche of the character, of what they had done and all of that. However, um, I haven't made many physical notes here and I make up for it by writing down a ton of things inside the book itself. Um, so, as you can see from here, in fact, I have got many, many dog marked pages. So basically these pages are where I have made notes. For instance, here it's it's full of notes and that is that is how I made up for the lack of physical notes in my copy. So as you can see, um, this is a tissue paper, <laughs> obviously, but like I was having tea or coffee or something like that and I suddenly got all of these ideas so I wrote them down on this tissue paper that I had on my, on my hand at the moment. And these are some important notes which I made on, on the themes, I think, uh, overall. This was not a one-time thing. I wrote certain notes and then I kept it inside. Um, this is page two. Where did I start writing them? Yeah. So I wrote slavery and its destruction of identity, importance of community solidarity, powers and limits of language and all of that. And then I wrote about the symbols, how they all meant different, different things. Um, so basically that is how I made the notes for Beloved. Now another factor that like kind of, as you can see, heavily marked pages. Another factor that um, was the reason why I didn't make many notes is because our teacher really did give us a lot of materials on it. So that kind of <laughs> um, balances it out. Also, again, like I have been saying, I kind of got disinterested towards the middle, the later part of part two. So. I kind of lost motivation there but because the teacher sent us a lot of notes and materials um, papers that we could read and so basically that is the reason why I don't have much of a note for beloved because whatever I wrote inside I'm going to refer to them again plus I really do remember what uh, happened in this and basically all the different papers that the teacher gave us as reference to study and to go through they were also very very um, intensive they 
time to write in into the book really and that is why it will be very helpful for me to study them and understand um i mean i did understand the book but for the from the exam point of view those notes would be very very helpful so that's it for beloved let me show you the other books a room of one's own by virginia wolf um now this one i'm actually reading for um for my research paper so this is not really ghost related but i chose this myself and since i will be going back to it again and again for my research paper obviously all of these marking themselves will help like as you can see like i know how i mark stuff so um again stars are like really important um lines or important conclusions that i can include in my book and then the writing style stream of consciousness instance one is when the author the first instance that the author is differentiated because she could not walk on the grass i think yeah this is that instance um and then again the second instance she was not allowed into the library without the um without a man on her side Again, I also made a note of Virginia Woolf's writing style, like the sarcasm, the wittiness that is included here. Also, the uh, the, the differences in um, the funds that were available easily, so easily available for men's colleges, but what the reality was for women and all of that. Intellectual folks, it, I have a lot of notes. For, um, like as we all know Virginia Woolf writes a lot in the stream of consciousness method so she kind of rambles a bit but again yeah all of that um, that is why I've underlined these lines this is the third instance um, it was the food I think here was the soup it was plain gravy soup yeah this is the food and all of that uh, what is good here is that the author Virginia Woolf does include a lot of uh, citations and for all of those citations she has given uh, mm, given like the proper credits so it's again really helpful for me to take all of these as source for my research paper uh, it is really helpful I have I don't know why I have this but nevertheless um yeah i've got dog mark pages again because this is quite an important thing and all of that now like you have all probably realized that my style of annotating really depends on the book uh, for instance this one we had to do do it mostly ourselves the teacher wanted us to really utilize our intellectual faculties so this one is really in depth this one um, I personally lost interest in the middle a bit and the teacher gave us a lot of notes and materials which will be really helpful and this one is uh, this is only my first reading and I'll be going back to it again and again so that is why it's not heavily marked and that is how I basically annotated all of these three different books however um, this is the book that I'll be starting with now the awakening by Kate Chopra now I require this for my gender studies class and I haven't started at all so I'll be starting it now obviously and that is why I'll take you along with me and show you how I annotate this book because um, I think a life like sort of um, annotating session will be much more helpful than me going over all the previous annotations that I have done also um, I think I'll be writing also uh, I do not really use page flags or markers much I mean I do use them sometimes but not always I think as long as I can avoid using them that's well and good I can just write down the notes on the book inside the book itself on the sides with the pages or with a pen I don't really mind annotating the books like that I mean it's your personal choice I prefer writing down my thoughts on the margins with 
a pen rather than using a sticky sticky note or a page mark i mean i do use page markers sometimes to like mark the important pages as opposed to dog marking them but then i don't think i have got any with me right now so um dog marking it will be okay so change of location um let's start annotating the awakening uh, for this, I'm just going to take basically two pens, I think uh, a blue uh, ball pen and a black sketch pen. Um, I just have a black ball pen with me also just in case, but I don't think I'll be using it, but I have it with me. So the format that I basically start in is I always write the name of the book. So... The Awakening by K. Chopra and the year in which it was first published which is 1899 because the year is always important. Then well let's start with the book. Again it starts with this first chapter so I'll just write here like really big Great, then let's start. Uh, now this basically means get out, get out, damn it. So I know what the book is about. So for me, I think this is sort of a foreshadowing. So what I understand from it, I'll write that down now. So as you can see, uh, characters have been mentioned here. We have uh, Mr. Pontelia and we have a uh, Madame Libran. So it is always good to have a list of characters. And for that, I am going to use the other side of the page. And I'll basically write down all the characters here. So this is a page which I'll be keeping common. For instance, once I'm done with writing the notes on this page, I will directly shift to um, the next page because it is really good to have a common page where you can write down the characters and things basically which you have to refer back to again and again. Also, since I am doing this for my college, um, I can also write down the different aspects of every character. So then later on when I want to make a character sketch, say, for each different character, this will be very, very helpful for me. Now again, there is a mention of this green grand isle. Uh, so this is the description of Mr. Pontelia. Okay. Mm. So it's on page two and it's like a star is given. So I'll give the same star here. I'll write down page two and physical attributes. And then um, this is my point one. So we'll go to point two. Uh, The Ponteliers had come to Grand Isle mm. the day before 
the story starts on a Sunday. Hence, Saturday from New Orleans. Okay, so we have another two um, characters, the Fairy Bard twins. So I'm just going to leave some space and continue here. Uh, Fairy Bard twins, two young girls, and then I'll also write here has two sons one is let's say four yeah one is four other is five mm. they have a quadroon nurse great So this is quite an important piece right here. You are burnt beyond recognition, he added. He is the husband here and he's saying this to his wife. Looking at his wife as one looks at a valuable piece of personal property which has suffered some damage. So this is really important. I'm going to write this down as an instance here on page, like on point three. Page three, you are burned beyond recognition. Mr. Pontelier's perception. So this line itself shows the perception, like Miss, uh, Mr. Pontelier's perception of his wife as property. So this is like a commodification of women, the treatment, basically the treatment of women in those times. In those times was always in relation to men I'm going to underline this because this is very important they are always uh, treated in relation to men and never as individuals
Hey guys, so I wanted to give you another example of annotation that I do. We are in chapter 2 by the way. So right now, uh, this is, there is a mention of the Quartier Francais, which basically means the um, French Quarter. And it's not something that I would write in my notes per se, but however, I remembered it like it struck a chord because uh, I wrote here New Orleans French Quarter and I first came across this reference in as you, have, as you can see reference in a streetcar named Desire and what it is a modern neighborhood uh, blacks and whites live together rather peacefully in that um, quarter so this is that reference and I didn't think this is important enough to be written down in the actual notes and so I just made some notes in the margins. This is another type of annotation that I do. It always depends on um, the importance of the word and stuff like that. Another thing that I just did and I didn't really film actually I wanted that I want to show you is the themes. Now since I'm reading this for class I have to keep in mind the important themes and that is why what I did here <clears throat> is after making a note of something I wrote down in black sketch pen what theme I can see here or um, infer from here so I have identity I have patriarchy um, the treatment of women marriage as a cage a binding institution and then gender privilege or its lack thereof like gender privilege in males they can go out um, they have relative much more freedom in comparison to women um, so it's a privilege that they have gender privilege um, it's lack thereof is in females they cannot go out alone they need to have a male companion and if not a male they need to have a proper chaperone all of that so yeah that is how I write down the themes and later on it's very easy to compare them with examples from the text because I'm writing them in reference to the certain ev events that have happened so then it is really easy for me to say suppose write about the theme of identity in the novel with uh, certain uh, with reference to certain instances from the book so I can write a lot about the theme and then when I have to bring in reference give examples then this is one for identity and all of that I I mean this is just chapter two so as we go as we go on into the book I'm sure we'll get more and more um, examples for identity more and more examples for uh, gender privilege and all of that so it's really um, all encompassing and the notes really grow as you read the book so that's another update so we are in chapter 3 and I have got an example here um, which I try to think a lot so I'll read out the line he thought it very discouraging that his wife, who was the sole object of his existence, evinced so little interest in things which concerned him and valued so little his conversation. Now, uh, from what I've read throughout, this is the note that I made. What does he want? For his wife to be more attentive to him? Is it his dominant patriarchal male side that wants to be fed with attention? Or is it just a man, me husband, wanting attention from his wife which is just this is just an example of sort of like a rhetorical thinking rhetorical questioning that I do to myself because um, okay from the exam point of view this will really help you because at least it helps me because then I can write both sides of the argument I can write if I'm looking at it through this side um, through him as a dominant or patriarchal male demanding attention from his wife I have got one explanation and if I want another side of the argument that is a husband wanting attention from his wife which is all right um, that is also um, that also gives you another part to think upon so it's just it leads a lot to critical thinking and it really makes you analyze the text and it's not always necessary that you arrive at an exact answer in literature. I mean, most of the times you don't. Literature is like that. Sometimes you don't reach an exact um, conclusion. Most of the times it's something very abstract and like that. It just makes you think a lot. So the sort of uh, rhetorical questioning that you pose to yourself, questions that you pose to yourselves are very helpful and important in um, making 
sure that you have that particular thinking process which really helps you analyze the book and thus to really understand the book. So hey guys, a change of position once again. We are back again in my, uh, in my bedroom. We are situated at my table and this is where we are going to continue. So right now we are in chapter 4 and I have reached quite an interesting point. So here the author is talking about uh, mother women as in women who like to coddle their children and all of that. Uh, they were the women who idolized their children, worshipped their husbands and esteemed the holy privilege to efface themselves as individuals and grow wings as ministering angels. So basically the author is talking about all, the, all um, this kind of woman. And our protagonist, Edna Pontelier, is apparently not a mother woman. However, there is the mention of another woman who is um, the epitome of a mother woman. Uh, one of them was the embodiment of every womanly grace and charm. So this was Adele Retinol. And as such, the author is, is placing her in opposition to the main character who is Edna Pontelia. And so we can say that Adele Retignol is a foil. Foil means an opposite character. She is an opposite character, a foil to um, Edna Pontelia. So we will write down her description once again. Now this, as we remember, this was my um, character's page. Let me just mute my laptop. Done. So Edna, uh, this is my character's page where I wrote down about all the characters. Now, uh, this is about Edna Pontelli and I am going to leave a few lines wherein I can add this uh, different descriptions of her. So from page number 14, um, I have that she was, double inverted comma, not a mother hyphen woman. So this is one of the descriptions that we can use when we are writing her character sketch, for example. Then we move on to um, Adele Retignol. Uh, Adele Retignol, who is a foil to Edna. And we'll write again in inverted commas how she has been described. Usually the first words, the first few words that the author uses to describe a character are the main important ones and the ones which the teacher also most of the time remembers. So if you can quote them, it is really, really helpful um, because the author will think, oh wow, uh, not author, sorry. The teacher will think, oh wow, the student has really um, gone inside the book and she remembers the way this author has described this particular character. So it's really helpful if you can quote the exact words that the author uses to first describe a new character. So in the case of Retignol, she is described as the embodiment um, of every womanly grace and charm. And because it's always helpful, write down the page number in reference to this page. So that's one way of writing down uh, details about each character. And I usually, I always, not usually, I you um, always like keep in mind the way each new character, the way in which every new character is um, introduced or described by the author because those lines usually uh, mean the most. Um, so, within the same paragraph that Adele Ratignol is introduced in, we are given more description about her which um, really reflects how society expects the women to be the wives, the mothers to be in those times. I'll just read a few words. There are no words to describe her save the old ones that have served so often to picture the bygone heroine of romance and the fair lady of our dreams. There was nothing subtle or hidden about her charms. Her beauty was all there, flaming and apparent. The spun gold hair that combed no confining pin could restrain. The blue eyes that were like nothing but sapphires. Two lips that pouted that were so red one could only think of cherries and some other delicious crimson fruit in looking at them. 
She was growing a little stout, but it did not seem to detract an iota from the grace of every step, pose, and gesture. One would not have wanted her white neck a mite less full or her beautiful arms more slender. Never were hands more exquisite than hers, and it was a joy to look at them when she threaded her needle or adjusted her gold thimble to, taper her, to her taper middle finger as she sewed away on the little night drawers or fashioned a bodies or a bib. So the latter part of the paragraph is her physical um, description. However, the beginning part where she is referred to as the heroines of the old romances, the fair lady of their dreams, this is very much a reference to, again, the women as they are expected to be. And from here, what I can remember or I can refer to is um, Angel in the House. I'll give a reference to this angel in the house versus mad woman in the attic now if you all know about this then well and good um, if you have not heard about it this is quite an important work in feminist studies by Gilbert and Gubar so you should definitely check that out and this really reminds me and uh, this is also this also this um, whole thing Angel of the House versus Mad Woman in the Attic can also be um, seen in reference to Jane Eyre, that is Bertha. So it's like that. I mean, all feminist works are can be related one to the other, especially because all of these books were pretty much within the same um, era, you could say. So that is another reference that I brought in. And again, in your answers, if you bring in references like this from different essays, different works, and not necessarily stick to the text itself, then um, it's really helpful. This is one example that I gave in from Gilbert and Gubar. Another example was when I brought in the reference from um, the earlier part, which I explained to you all, the French Quarter from um, The Streetcar Named Desire for New Orleans, which was quite novel because it was a comparatively very advanced much more modern society because in that neighborhood blacks and whites lived together so the see uh, the, the era of equality was emerging there it was much more ahead in times so that was another reference so it always helps if you bring in reference like that because it impresses the professor to be very frank and it gives the impression basically that you are well read and yeah so that's another tip try to bring in as many references as you can So hey guys, we are done with the notes, uh, at least <laughs> till chapter 11. Uh, so as you can see, this is the first page which uh, sees all the different themes, different of my observations basically from the first chapter. And then this is the characters page. And let me tell you that this is a work in progress. As we go on into the book, we will get more snippets for each character. Through different instances, we will get another glimpse of their different um, different qualities. So all of that will go here, and I think we might be um, introduced to more characters. I'm not sure. If we are, I'll probably have to take another new page. But that's that, and this is the first scene, and then this is a continuation from chapter two. Chapter 4 is quite short, uh, sorry, 5 and 6 are quite short, um, like that. And uh, this is an important line from chapter 11, which basically speaks about Edna awakening. Um, and since awakening, awaken, to awaken, the word awaken is in the title. Any reference to the word awaken, the first reference to the word awaken is very, very important because Edna is finally um, aware of her situation. One important thing that I want to tell you all is that don't be obsessed with making your notes really pretty and everything. I mean, it really doesn't matter. My notes are never this um, pretty. I mean, for the, for the sake of this video, I try to keep it a bit neat. But like there are some times when you are so absorbed into the book that you just... Uh, think and you write and it's a whole consuming process so the handwriting doesn't really matter as long as you understand your handwriting really the handwriting doesn't matter so don't be obsessed with keeping 
a very beautiful note like you see in like instagram or pinterest all of that if that is natural do it fine if it's not something that comes naturally to do to you then i don't think you should do it for me i think using different colors of pen i mean i use the basic colors i'm not saying don't use any colors at all i mean um, that you should use at least two colors so that it becomes easy to differentiate and to um, basically highlight certain points I personally feel that uh, using two or three minimal colors is all right but if I use anything more than that like four or five colors highlighters all of that it just becomes very messy in my head and I cannot um, understand any of that so that is what I do I like to keep it very very minimalistic I just use my what um, blue ball pen and the black sketch pen and that's it don't be obsessed with perfection again I'm telling you because this is a work in progress again in class if there are more discussions I'm going to be writing in the margins and all of that and it's going to be very ugly and not at all pretty so what you should um, strive for is that your notes should be understandable should help you learn and uh, learn the important part about parts about the whole um, book all that it should be convenient for you it sh you shouldn't have to go out of your way to make the notes pretty or aesthetic all of that so that's my tip for you uh, i just finished chapter 11 like i said there are a total of 34 chapters if i'm not wrong um, and yeah, I was wrong. There are a total of 39 chapters, which I think I'll, uh, I'll be doing the rest tomorrow for now. Uh, I am done with chapter 11 and I'm going to keep it aside. Um, when it's another thing, when it's an assignment, learn to give yourself breaks because breaks are very, very important. I did 11 chapters and I'm going to call it tonight. For now, I'm going to continue the next 11 tomorrow or if I... If the chapters are really short i might read more more than 11 like that you know you have to know when to give yourself a break so that's pretty much it for the annotating bit and i hope the video is really helpful for you and yeah i hope you all find it beneficial for yourself for your notes especially if you are into english literature as well i hope the tips help and don't forget to le leave comments down below if you thought it was helpful, um, certain suggestions, certain tips that you personally use and would like to share with others, certain things you might not agree with me, my way of uh, annotating and all. It, it can be a debate, of course. You, can, you don't have to agree with everything I say, obviously. So you can drop in your suggestions, your tips, your recommendations and all of that. Uh, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and click on the bell icon down below so that you will be notified every time a video of mine goes up. And yeah, I'll see you soon.